Well, good morning, everyone. Warm welcome to you all, and a warm welcome to those uh, tuning in from online. Uh, it's just good to have you all, and it's good to be back in church again. We've missed it over the past couple of weeks. Now, bear with me this morning. I have just a couple of announcements. It's that time of year when the announcements pile up. Uh, this Wednesday, I'm just wondering if I could ask for a little bit of help if you're available. This Wednesday, or possibly this Thursday, it has yet to be confirmed, we're going to do our annual calendar drop around the Mayo Bridge uh, Village, and I've also prepared a little DVD message. And so if you have an hour to spare to put calendars through the door, I uh, would really appreciate coming to see me, uh, so thank you ahead of that. Also, uh, on Wednesday or not on Wednesday, our midweek prayer meeting and Bible study has stopped until after Christmas. We'll resume it uh, just uh, shortly after Christmas. However, could I ask you to continue to keep one another and our community uh, in your prayers? Uh, thank you for that. You might have had a look on our updated website. It's www.rathfrylandpresbyterian.com. It's a uh, you'll find a lot more on it than there used to be on it, uh, including there's an Advent uh, devotional. It's a daily devotional that's up every day, which includes uh, a reading and a prayer and a song, uh, uh, a Christmas carol, uh, and also the midweeks devotions on the Psalms, all of our sermons from back to March are all on it as well. And so we hope to be adding some uh, some of our previous sermon material to it at some stage. And you can also book your seat directly from the website, so I'd encourage you to do that. You can also do it by sending Brian a message, uh, but you can also do it from the website. For those of you who get the Presbyterian Herald, you haven't been getting it this year, but it will be resuming from 2021, but just four of them will come out four uh, once a quarter. And the good news is, for, you, uh, for those of you who subscribed to it last year and paid for it last year, there'll be no charge for it this year, so that'll be coming. Uh, Beatrice has asked me to announce that anyone wishing to have their giving including in this, included in this year's finance should have it in before the 31st of December, because anything after that will be put into 2021. And can I just take the opportunity to thank you for your giving. Really appreciate it throughout this year. It's been a difficult year. And also perhaps to remind us of our giving and remind us to give if that's an area that you may have neglected over the year. I guess it's been a difficult year for churches. Our offerings probably stand, we're down about 10%. And, and that's, that's understandable. I think most churches would have the same story. But both to thank you for your giving and also to remind you if you have allowed that to slip. Our Kirk session has agreed a slightly changed Christmas timetable for 2020, changed from what it was last year. Next Sunday morning, we would have been having our nativity service, but we'll not be having that. Uh, we are, however, going to have our carol service that night. So next Sunday night at half past six here in Third Church, we're going to be having our carol service. And it'll be a candlelit service as well, which will be lovely. We'll have our Sunday school children. Uh, many of them have been asked to do a video recording of our reading, a Bible reading, and they've been sending that in to me. So the children will be present online doing their readings and there'll be carols, and it will be, it'll, be, it'll be great. Now, the church will be cleaned down, and we have a fogging machine, and all that will be done just right after the Sunday morning service, so that'll allow us to meet safely. Uh, safely. And so if you plan to be there, can I ask you to book in? Uh, because it's Sunday night, there may be more than what there is normally, so if you can book your seats, so whether through the website or send... Brian a message, and if you can do that in good time this week, that would be great. And also in our amended timetable, because of the COVID restrictions, we're not able to have our Christmas Eve carols by candlelight service in second, my favourite of all our church services that we have throughout the year, but we're not able to have that this year. We will be meeting Christmas morning at half past ten here for a short service, and children, as always, who attend 
are welcome to bring a toy. I don't know how I'm going to do it this year with the toys, but we'll figure uh, something out. And if you're uncomfortable in coming and bringing a toy, we've also the facility now to allow people to join us via Zoom. So up on these screens here will be those who want to join us via Zoom. And so if you're at home with your kids and you have a toy and you want to show it to us, we would just love that. And so you'll be able to do that from Zoom. And I'll have great crack interviewing you and asking you what your toy does all from there. So, And I'll have the meeting ID for that Zoom up uh, on the WhatsApp group, and I'll be announcing it next Sunday. Uh, so if you want to join us on the Christmas morning service by Zoom. That's all my announcements. I don't think I've forgotten any. If I have, forgive me. Our call to worship this morning is Titus 2.11. I'll be referring to this verse throughout uh, my sermon. It says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And I think that's a particularly poignant verse to think upon at Christmas time, for that is when he came. We'll sing our first Christmas carol of the year, O come all ye faithful. And perhaps we could stand for this, and sit for the next one and stand for the last one. If you're comfortable to stand, that is. If you're not comfortable to stand, please remain in your seats. Christmas carols. So let's come to our, uh, our loving Savior and let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we journey towards uh, this Christmas, this very different Christmas, 
Uh, may we do so, Lord, uh, with an awakened interest in our Savior who came. We ask, O oh God, that we, as we approach in the busyness of all that we have to do, that our eyes would be every day open to you and our hearts turn towards you in prayer and praise. Lord, even amidst all the busyness that we have to do to be ready, just increase in our hearts a renewed sense of wonder, of anticipation that the Savior of the world has come, that the wonder of the incarnation, God coming here, born as a little baby, Oh God, may we not miss that. May we not even miss you this morning. Help our hearts to be ready to, to celebrate, oh God, to rejoice with the angels who announced today a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Oh God, may that message ring in our hearts, we pray and ask. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So, boys and girls, there's a few of you here, and there's more of you online. I trust, I hope that you have been getting ready for Christmas. I am so totally ready this year like no other year. I have bought my presents, believe it or not. Do you want to pull that screen up there, Johnny, if it's, uh, you're able to get it? And I've eventually got the tree up. We got the tree up this week. It took us a while. I know some of you have had your tree up from about October, but we're a bit later than that. And we have put our wee decorations up. This is our Santa. There's more stuff than that. Put on the next one as well. Uh, bought this the other day. It's in the window. And there's more wee things like that hanging around uh, the house. And have a look at the next slide. What do you see the next one? We bought as a special gift to ourselves a new sofa. Robert Brady and Johnny Brady came the other day with the trailer and took the old one away. It had a big rip down through the seat of it. And they took it to the skip. So we're very thankful for that. And so with our new sofa, we'll be able to relax and watch some TV and be able to, with those recliners, sleep off that big turkey dinner. So I'm really looking forward to Christmas this year because I'm a little bit ready for it. And uh, let me show you another decoration that we have. This is a very special decoration to me. It, it's, a, it's, it's a knitted nativity scene. And it was knitted by a lady who belongs to Scarva Street a number of years ago and given to me as a parting gift. And we put it out every year and it's my favorite of all things to put up. And we have one here. Lorna Johnson has knitted this. And uh, so if I can turn it around very carefully. Can you zoom in on that, Johnny, so that people can see? Uh, and the nativity scene, oh, that's an awful close picture of me. That's it, wee bit more. That's it, that's much better. The nativity scene speaks of how God, how heaven got ready for Christmas because there was so much to do there as well. God sent the angels to speak to the shepherds. I'm going to pull out one of the shepherds here. See if you can... Hang on. Am I on this? No, I'm on this. That's all right. There we go. Oops. Yeah. Very good. So this is a brilliant shepherd, there's three of them, as you would know. Uh, actually, when I, pulled our, uh, uh, when I pulled our nativity scene out of the attic the other day, Helen found mice droppings. I missed them, but there was mice droppings on Mary and Joseph, but thankfully they weren't chewed. And I thought, well, if God could protect them from Herod, he protected them from the mice. But there's no such droppings on this. And God had to send the angels to, uh, to the shepherds to get them ready. And he also had to send angels to the wise men. Here's the wise men. And he, well, he didn't send an angel to them, but he had to prepare a star 
in order for the wise men to follow. So I'll put that wise men back in there, the very scarce round Rathfra Island. So I want to lose them. And uh, he also sent, I think that's Joseph there. He had to send an angel to Joseph to get him ready as well. And uh, he also had to get the stable ready. And, but his greatest of all preparation was the baby Jesus. I actually have two baby Jesus at home in my knitted nativity set. I don't know how I ended up with two, but we only need one, that's for sure. So God's greatest preparation was to send the baby Jesus here. And there's a verse in Galatians says, In the fullness, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son into the world, born of a woman, born under the law. So there was a great deal of preparation that was put in place so that we could have Christmas as we understand it. Everything was perfect. And the reason that God went to all that preparation, all that trouble, was so that that boys and girls and mums and dads could know about the Savior, could come to him in faith, put their trust in him so that he would become their Savior. And that's what Christmas is all about. You know, the verse I, the, that I've been thinking about lately was the angel speaking to Joseph uh, who told him that Mary would give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All the preparation that went into that first Christmas is so that we could be saved from our sins. And when we invite him into our lives, when we say, Lord, I choose you to be my Savior and I want to follow you, then that's what happens. Our sins are forgiven and we receive new life. And that's the central message of Christmas. And as we journey towards that date, let's keep that in our focus. So thank you for listening. We're going to sing our second carol. We're calling this a children's carol this morning. So Away and a Manger, another one of my favorites. And we'll keep our seats. Sunday that we said our goodbyes to a long time and faithful member uh, of our church who sat just back there on the uh, on that side of the church in the same seat that she that for um, she sat in for 90 years in the same seat that her parents sat in before uh, Mrs. Muriel McCracken and so we're going to miss her uh, and Christmas is 
for many tinged with that bit of sadness because we remember loved ones who are not here. We're going to pray for the McCracken family and we're going to pray too that God would be with an increasingly busy uh, NHS and for wisdom for those tasked with uh, managing our virus over this Christmas season that they would find help from heaven above. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time of year. It just is filled with hope and purpose and joy, Lord, as the message rings out, a Savior is born. A Savior is born to you who is Christ the Lord. And yet in this weary world, Lord, this world that has its share of trouble and difficulty and death and separation, Lord, there it can be difficult, particularly at this time of year. And so we want to bring to you, our God in heaven, those who mourn, those who weep, those who struggle, those under pressure. We ask for your help and strength for them. We think of the McCracken family, Lord. We pray for them this morning. We bear them up and ask that the grace of God Almighty would be with them, that the comfort of the Father, Lord, would be their portion. And not just them, Lord, but all who miss and mourn and for whom, Lord, Christmas is perhaps a time of memory when those who were there are not there. Lord, would you bless? Would you help? They will have their moments over this season, but we pray that in those moments you would be present, O oh God. We give you thanks, Lord, for the vaccine already being rolled out uh, across the country. Uh, and we pray, O oh God, we know that there will not be an instant fix, that uh, numbers may well yet rise again. And so we pray for those under great pressure and stress to manage all this. We think of our NHS staff, and we ask for your help from heaven for them. Some will be working long hours over the Christmas season, uh, and so we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them and grant them some time with their family. We pray for those in government, Lord, that are tasked with uh, making decisions, Lord, to keep us all safe. And we pray that you would bless them and be their help and strength too, Lord God. And we ask, O oh God, that in your sovereignty, 2021 would bring a change, that, Lord, this we will be uh, inoculated and kept safe from the vaccine and numbers would steadily decrease. We think of those, Lord, too, in the negotiating teams for Brexit, Lord, and we pray that there would be a breakthrough that would be, um, Lord, suitable for us, Lord. We just pray and ask, O oh God, because there are many businesses and livelihoods and futures dependent on a deal, and so we, we just commit that into your care. You are the, the God of heaven and earth. And so, Lord, we ask you these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, these days in my wee sermon series, uh, we are looking at the lesser-known characters of Scripture that leave us with something to learn. So I thought from now until Christmas, I would do a wee focus on characters that we find in the nativity scene or in the, in the Christmas story in Scripture. It'll be, I guess it'll be a sort of a minor character and major lessons Christmas style. Now, this morning's character, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure if they even exist. Oh, they're in the Christmas story, all right. They're there every year. If there was a Christmas play, they would probably be in it this year, as they're in it most years. But when we actually look at Scripture, they're not there. They're absent. Uh, there's an assumption that they're there, and so we put them in, but a careful reading of the gospel, and there's actually no sign of this person. And though they're always cast as a man, they may not even be a man. They could be a woman. That is, if they even exist. So how do I preach on a character that may or, not, may or may not even be in the Bible? That's a good question. You can tell me if I've succeeded at the end of all this. 
I wonder if anyone has the remotest clue of who I'm talking about. Who is it that we put in, uh, put in place in the nativity scene year by year but doesn't actually get a mention in the Bible? If you have a clue, put your hand up. Yes, well, one, two, a few. Okay, let's see if you're right. It's the innkeeper. Did you get it right? Well, it's the guy that comes to the door and says in his famous line, no room at the inn. That's his, that's his famous line. And perhaps as an afterthought, maybe he sees Mary's uh, 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 pregnant, her, her heavily pregnant condition. He says, oh, you can use my stable out the back. And come to that, actually, there's not even a mention of a stable in the Bible. We assume there's a stable, but there's actually not a mention of a stable. Uh, Jesus, perhaps we assume because Jesus was led in the feeding trough, and there probably was a stable. Uh, But anyway, back to our innkeeper. So let me read the scene where all of that happens. It's in Luke 2, 1 to 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for him. There was no guest room available for him. Well, I guess you could say, at the very least, Uh, Mary and Joseph, not to mention Luke, the writer of the gospel, had to know that, didn't they? So a door had to be knocked and the question had to be asked and the refusal had to be given and a stable had to be offered. That all had to happen if Mary and Joseph were to end up in the stable. I suppose it's possible there could have been a no vacancy sign in the window and seeing that the young couple moved their way out around the back and found an animal shed where, they lay, where, they, where Jesus was born. I guess that's possible, but it's unlikely. I'm sticking with an innkeeper. So, what can we learn from this man? And we'll keep him as a man, because I don't think a woman could have turned away a heavily pregnant woman in the heart of winter late at night. I don't think a woman could have done that. So what can we learn from him? What can we take from this implied innkeeper that will teach us our lesson this week? Well, I, I think that as we study the characters of Christmas, we can broadly divide them into two camps. Those who were spiritually aware at the time of Jesus' arrival and those who were not those who had been prepared by God to recognize the time of Christ's coming and those who failed to recognize the time of Christ's coming. And you'd have to say the innkeeper was in the camp of those who failed to recognize his coming. You could say that he missed the opportunity of his life. So he was in the camp of those of whom John's gospel states in John 1.11, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. I think he was in that camp. The innkeeper did not receive Jesus. He did not recognize the time of his coming. He was unprepared for the Messiah's arrival. But, and it's a fair question, should he have been? I mean, how could he possibly know by looking at Mary's bump that the Savior of the world lay within Mary. Well, on one level, he couldn't know. It was impossible. No one could know that way. But on another level, and I want you to think about this, we can point to people in the Christmas narrative who somehow did know, who did receive Jesus, who were prepared for his coming, who somehow recognized the time of his arrival. 
Take the Magi, for example, or the wise men as we know them. Those men from a different culture, an alien faith, the far country, they didn't even have a bump. All they had was a star, which they followed, which led them to Christ. And it's clear that they received Jesus as their Messiah because when they entered the stable, or most likely it was a house at that stage because Jesus was a little bit older, they saw the child and they believed. Now, Jesus was just an ordinary child. There was no halo around his head. There was nothing to mark him out as anything different than just an ordinary boy, perhaps as old as two years. Yet they believed. They saw the child and they believed, enough to take their precious treasures and lay them down at his feet. And the text says they worshipped. And there were other characters, too, who believed uh, without having uh, the evidence that we might like to have. Uh, Simeon and Anna, uh, two other characters included in the Christmas narrative, they both recognized in the infant that lay in Mary's arms the long-awaited Messiah. Simeon said, my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, he was looking at an ordinary little baby. How could he say that? He says, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Now, he was just looking at a child. How could he know? It's not as if Mary and Joseph entered the temple as part of a royal, entour a, a, a royal entourage King Joseph and Queen Mary with the royal baby and all of that was going. They were just an ordinary couple. You couldn't pick them out from anybody else except perhaps that they were very poor. There was nothing to make them stand out from the crowd. And Anna, also in the temple that day, seeing Jesus, she, she just gave thanks to God and turned to speak about the child to all those around her who, like her, were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So they knew. Some people knew. Some people didn't. But they did somehow. And those who did were, were in the other camp that John wrote about in his gospel, the camp that received him. Yet to all who received him, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. So the question to us as we think about this subject today is, how did they know? And that's an important question for us to consider today because how does a person know today? How does a person know and recognize God today. Because you can be sure of this. Some people know and some people don't. Some people approach, approach Christmas uh, with worship and wonder, and Jesus Christ is very much the center of it, and some people approach Christmas missing all of that. It's the season to be jolly. It's about family, it's presents, it's a few days off work, it's, it's a botheration, some people might say. But whatever it is, it's not about Christ. Christ is completely missed. It's as if they're the innkeeper, year by year, standing at the door saying, sorry, no room here. How is it that some people get God and some people don't? And that's a question I have to say constantly perplexes me as a minister. Because on one hand, folks, I find it's the case that those who do get him really ought not to have. Sometimes anyway. And those you'd think should get him don't. Why do some people get them and some people don't? Here's a couple of things it's not down to. It's not down to how smart a person is. It's not salvation by intelligence. And I'm really glad about that because, well, I wouldn't be here today if that were the case. 
there are some really dumb Christians I know and some really clever atheists. So it's not salvation by intelligence. It's also not down to how you've been brought up, whether or not you've been brought up to go to church or if you've been reared in a Christian home. Because I also know people from the godliest homes being baptized as a baby, being through Sunday school, youth, perhaps even attend church week by week, and yet they would still say, I'm not a Christian. I know people like that. And I know other people who have had no Christian influence in their life whatsoever, who've become, it seems in a very short time, passionate believers. So it's not salvation by Christianizing. And it's also not, and you've heard this being said often, I'm sure, it's not salvation by what we do or good works or strong morals or family values, that too. Now, those should be evident in every Christian's life, but it's possible to take Two people stand them side by side, compare their past life, and one has been a complete rogue, and the other has been, comparatively speaking, without blame, good upstanding citizen, and it's the rogue that has become a child of God, while the upstanding citizen is nowhere near the kingdom. That's possible. Jesus told the parable of two people in prayer, one man's prayer was a, just a long record of his own righteousness, and the other, well, he just stood there. He just couldn't even look up, couldn't even verbalize the many sins he had in his life. And yet, Jesus said, it was that man who went away justified before God rather than the other person. So how does this work? How do, why do some people get God and some people don't? Why did the innkeeper, almost certainly a Jew, and therefore one of the people, one of his own that he came to, as John puts it, why did he miss Jesus at his own front door while the wise men from a different faith, faraway country, actually found him? If it's not intelligence and it's not background or our behavior, what is it? Well, there's a book in the Bible, the book of Ephesians, that gives us in a very succinct verse what it is, gives us the answer. Salvation is by grace through faith. By grace alone through faith alone. Let me read it. It's on your screen. Verses 8 and 9, chapter 2. For it is by grace that a person is saved, becomes a Christian, has eternal life. Through faith. And the text adds, it's not from themselves. It is the gift of God. Not by their works, so no one can boast about it. And so, if we bring that text to our Christmas narrative, we could say that it was the grace of God that awakened the interest, enlightened the eyes, opened the ears of those who recognized Christ that first Christmas. The wise men, Simeon and Anna, the shepherds, Joseph, Mary, all who received Christ that first Christmas were unable to do it received him by grace. And it's the same gift of grace that enables people to come to Christ and be saved today. Exactly the same. But what is grace? What is that? Well, grace is just another way of saying help, God's help to do that. Divine help to be saved. It's as if he comes and helps us renowned theologian B.B. Warfield said, grace is free, sovereign favor to the ill-deserving. John Stott wrote, grace is love 
that cares and stoops and rescues. Jerry Bridges says, Grace is God reaching downward to people who are in rebellion against him. Grace is the opposite of karma. Karma is all about getting what you do deserve. Grace is about getting what we don't deserve and not getting what we do deserve. Because Christianity teaches us, doesn't it, that what we do deserve is actually God's judgment, death, no hope of the resurrection. Grace instead gives us what we don't deserve, which is eternal life and God's favor upon our life. So grace was presented to those who received Christ that first Christmas. And grace, God's help, is presented to each person who receives Christ today. But here's the thing about grace that I want to point out to you. It must be pursued with faith. God's salvation is by grace through faith. Imagine me receiving a present on Christmas Day, a beautifully wrapped bow on top, large label attached to my love, Happy Christmas. And I look at my love, and she nods with a smile and says, Yes, it's for you. Go and open it. But I haven't got her a thing. I can't, you know, I can't open it, I say. I haven't got you anything. doesn't matter, my love, she says. My love for you is unconditional. Even though you haven't got me anything, you go and open it that. Now, I know this illustration is a stretch for us to grasp, but bear with me. I look at the present, I look at my love, and I don't open it. I just feel too bad, too guilty. And so I, 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 I leave it under the tree. What have I done? Well, I've not only rejected her gift, but I lack the faith to believe that what she says is true, that she means, that she has given that to me regardless of what I can give back to her. And grace is the gift of eternal salvation for all of time, all of eternity. The free gift of all of that handed to the world by Jesus Christ. And faith is accepting that gift. Unaccepted, unopened, it remains in the possession of the giver, not the recipient for whom it was intended. John 3.16, we all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. That's grace right there. The gift of the Son is what he gave freely to all, to those who least deserved it. Here's the faith element, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know, it's one thing to state that Jesus died on the cross to forgive the sins of the world. It's another thing to state that he died for my sin. Faith, therefore, makes grace personal. It's faith that reaches out and grabs the gift and accepts it, even though we may feel undeserving of it, even though our pride, this inbuilt resistance to accept what he offers, kicks in. We say, oh, we couldn't possibly do that. I need to do something for you. It's faith that overcomes all that and accepts that gift. It's faith, you could say, that gets on a camel to follow a star. It's faith that sees beyond the ordinary couple with the baby and Uh, believes the witness of the Spirit within that tells them this child is different. This child is, in fact, the Savior of the world. So why were the two camps that first Christmas? 
those who received and those who rejected. And why are there two camps every Christmas? The grace of God, folks, has appeared to us all. That's what Titus says. I read it in the early verse. The grace of God has appeared of, that offers salvation to all people, but only some have faith. And living in the hearts of those who received Christ that first Christmas was faith. Their hearts were soft. They were open to God. Their hearts had been prepared to recognize His coming through through a knowledge of His will that He would come. They were in a state of readiness for it. And a heart like that is humble, is guidable is able to read the signs of his coming, and as as a result, when he did come, they were ready for it. They somehow recognized it. And that's why I think the innkeeper missed him, because his heart wasn't ready, hadn't been softened because he closed it to God. This was a man, it's clear by his actions, was too preoccupied with what was going on behind him in the inn as he stood at his front door to recognize what was in front of him, the young couple. Think about it. What sort of a man late at night and hard at winter turns away a heavily pregnant girl? Remember, Mary's only 13, 14 years old. She's a child. Could not a space have been found, even for her alone, if Joseph had been sent out? Could not have some of his other guests, perhaps the children, doubled up? I mean, where there's a will, there's a way. And although he offered them the stable, there's no record of him turning up later to check on her, to see how she is, did she have her baby, did she need anything? There's no female help sent out to this pregnant girl. Mary and Joseph were left alone. And what might he have been doing? Is he sitting in his office counting his taking? This is his busy season, for after all. Or is he fast asleep in his bed? And what might have been going through his mind? I'm only speculating here. We're not told any of this. But as they were standing at the front door, was it, this is just an inconvenience to me right now. I'm busy. I'm full. I have no room. And I don't want to upset my good paying guests by asking them to move. And what if she does have the baby tonight? Well, sure, there'll be noise and disruption and, and people won't come back. Whatever the reason for his preoccupation the innkeeper, because his heart was elsewhere, missed the most significant birth in human history and missed an encounter with God. He missed that. And I think that's why, folks, he is in the the did-not-receive-him camp instead of those who did receive him camp. It's because what was in here, his heart was elsewhere. And what if he had opened his heart? Where might that have led him to? What if he had opened his door and said, okay, we'll make room for you somewhere? Might he have witnessed the shepherds piling into his inn, bringing encounters of angelic glory? He might. And might he have been strangely moved like the wise men were when they seen the child to worship? He might. And might his life from that moment on have been forever changed? Who knows? All I know is that in closing his front door to them, he removed from himself the grace that had appeared to him at that moment. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. You know, there's always two camps at Christmas. There always is. Those for whom Christ 
is at the centre and those for whom he's on the fringe, if at all, even there. And which one might you be in? Has your heart been prepared or is it preoccupied? Are you against the conviction not to closing a door on Christ? Or are you in this phase of opening your heart up to him, stirred by God's word, believing that there's an awakened interest in the things of God. That is a good thing. Folks, I'm finishing soon. When we with faith accept the gift offered, that opens up our life to receive an ever fuller revelation of Jesus Christ. A fullness that will consummate at his second coming. You see, because he's coming again. There were those who missed him at his first coming and received him at his first coming, and there were those who will miss him and receive him at his second coming. And it's hearts that are open now and prepared now are being made ready for then. So the innkeeper, whether he existed or not, our minor character of today leaves us with a lesson to take away. Be in the right camp this Christmas. Be open-hearted. Allow your heart to be prepared and made ready. Accept the gift of his salvation because through this word, through the whole environment of the Christmas story, we can say the grace of God is appearing to you. The grace of God that offers salvation to all people. It's up to you to pursue it with faith. Let me pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of God, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came. That is an historical fact. We thank you that he died, that he rose again, and that he will one day come again to take our ready people, our prepared people home to be with him. Help us to be among those who are ready now, prepared now and not left to later. And so we commit ourselves into your care to that end, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We'll sing our final hymn, our final carol, Heart the Herald Angels Sing. And we'll stand to sing. Jesus.
So we ask, O God, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with us all evermore. Amen. Oh, 